In 1984, French philosopher Jacques Derrida defined the nuclear war as a fabulously textual reality, about which one can only talk and write about, because it has not yet, and in a sense, cannot ever take place, since if it did, there would be no place remaining. Clear and concise. In the common imagination, but also in practice, there is only one way to attempt to escape the disastrous effects of a nuclear detonation, holding up in a fallout shelter. A bunker is nothing more than an underground shelter that in a wartime context is exploited to protect armaments, resources and military personnel. This was true at least until August 1945, when the world verified the existence of a weapon capable of exterminating the human race, the atomic bomb. According to American professor David Pike, it was precisely the Cold War, with which the danger of a global nuclear holocaust was associated, that gave rise to the so-called bunker fantasy, that is, the widespread belief that bomb shelters are necessary for the safety of mankind. Well, someone has taken this concept literally. We are talking about Switzerland, the most bunkered country in the world. With its about 370,000 private fallout shelters, plus 9,000 public ones intended for those who don't have the budget to install them in their own homes, on paper, Switzerland is able to protect as many as 9 million people from radiation, or more than 100% of its entire population. Impressive, huh? But how did it happen? It all starts with a pre-Cold War bunker fantasy. We are at the beginning of the Second World War. France has been defeated by the Third Reich, which towers in the north, and has annexed Austria. To the south, on the other hand, is fascist Italy. Although Switzerland declared neutrality, rising border tensions prompted the authorities to prepare for a fight. On July 25, 1940, General Henri Guizan suggested making the Alps, Switzerland's natural barrier, the largest fortress in Europe. The plan is as follows. Abandon the northern and southern borders, as well as the center of the country, to allow the army to hold up in a network of military shelters built into the rocks. In fact, the so-called National Redoubt Strategy, also known as Schweizer Redoui or Redoui National, had been nagging at the minds of the Swiss government since the 1880s, and the Second World War only served as a fuse for the project to be carried out. This alpine fortification consisted of three main bastions, the Gotthard, Saint Maurice and Sargans complexes, overseeing 70 other mountain citadels and 10,000 bunkers, capable of housing hundreds of men each, protected by armored doors and stocked with food, weapons and ammunition. According to an estimate reported by the New York Times in 1999, the redoubt cost Switzerland $10 billion. Judged in retrospect, this strategy would be considered, yes, a huge deterrent designed to discourage Axis forces from invading the Alps, but also an absurd idea. In fact, reducing the country in the view of the Swiss generals meant sacrificing the central plains where the vast majority of the population lived. In short, it was a calculation based on the survival of the armed forces alone. Yet, the obsession of the fortress between the Alps would survive in a different form after the Second World War. In the presence of a far more deadly threat than air raids and tank advances, namely the atomic bomb, the Swiss public became increasingly aware of the need to protect itself from all-out war. It wasn't only the Iron Curtain that haunted Swiss military strategists, but the very real risk that the Cold War could soon hit up. As early as the Korean War of 1950-1953, the Swiss Federal Council, or the seven-member directorate that performs the functions of both government and head of state, ruled that every newly constructed building should be equipped with an air raid shelter. Then, in 1956, the Suez Crisis prompted the Federal Council to raise civil defense to the status of a constitutional right and the ultimate responsibility of state authorities. That said, defense finds constitutional constitutional protection in Article 2, in the part that states that the Confederation safeguards the security of the country. But two additional historical contingencies would prompt the Swiss government to apply drastic measures in preparation for a global conflict that seemed inevitable at the time. The building of the Berlin Wall in 1961 and the Cuba Missile Crisis in October 1962. Not surprisingly, also in 1962, the Swiss Parliament created a Federal Office for Civil Protection, abbreviated to FOCP, still in existence today, whose tasks are to inform and alert citizens in case of danger and coordinate possible rescue operations. 
In October 1963, by unanimous vote of both Houses of Parliament, the Federal Act on Civil Defense Construction was passed. This provided for the installation of public fallout bunkers in every settlement with more than 1,000 inhabitants. And not only that, under Article 46, all property owners were to construct and equip their own bomb shelter. This was a rather ambitious provision, but it was dictated by well-established ideological reasons. According to historian Silvia Berger-Ziaudin, Geistige Landesverteidigung, that is, the national intellectual defense, implied that bankers had to protect all fundamental Swiss values – federalism, freedom, independence and neutrality. At the same time, however, it was the latter that was sacrificed. Although Switzerland never became a NATO member, by the dawn of the 1960s the Swiss Federal Council clearly recognized who the enemy was, and that was communism. A year before the parliament in Bern enacted the federal law, the FOCP was given a council of 10 experts to figure out how to build bunkers that would protect people not only from a nuclear blast, but also from the resulting radiation. Yes, no one actually knew how to make one. At the time, the only theoretical compendium available in the West about the atomic bomb was the book The Effects of Nuclear Weapons, written by physicist Samuel Gladstone, published by the US government in 1957 and based on experiments conducted by the Pentagon in Nevada and the Bikini Atoll. In July 1963, the Swiss FOCP's board of experts invited a number of US and West German researchers to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich to design in cooperation with Washington a working prototype of a fallout bunker. There and then the conference turned out to be a failure. Yet in October, the Swiss parliament would still pass the Federal Act on Civil Defense Construction. This wasn't a reckless move. In fact, during the Zurich conference, the director of the Swiss Federal Federal Institute of Technology, military engineer Ernst Basler, came into contact with the Naval Radiological Defense Laboratory in San Francisco, Stanford University and MIT in Cambridge. Thanks to these connections, between 1964 and 1970, dozens of Swiss scientists traveled to the United States, gained access to their technologies and, once back home, contributed their knowledge to what we might call a veritable shelter boom. Within just six years, the number of private fallout bunkers in Switzerland reached 100,000, capable of protecting about 50% of the population. An astonishing achievement, considering that the United States itself has never been able to implement a structural program to spread the underground with bunkers. It may seem like nonsense to you, but the success and speed of the Swiss shelters lies in not having conducted experiments. Basler and the FOCP's board of experts had to act quickly to fulfill the provisions of the 1963 Construction Act, while trying to keep costs down. With the World War considered imminent, there was no time for testing, so scientists put together all the data they had collected on the effects of a nuclear explosion to design cost-benefit optimal countermeasures. Plants, walls, doors, floors and ventilation systems were designed according to the following calculation. With an estimated investment of 1,000 Swiss francs per person, Switzerland could have bunkers capable of saving from an atomic detonation 90% of all those who took shelter in them. The culmination of bunkering occurred starting in 1971, when the Federal Act on Civil Protection was extended to all settlements. Each private shelter would be 70% publicly funded. If one were to point to the greatest work of the entire fortification process in the Swiss Confederation, one couldn't fail to mention the Sonnenberg Tunnel. Opened in 1976 in Lucerne, hidden underneath a playground, one of the world's largest civilian bunkers cost about 40 million francs, was designed to extend along three kilometers of tunnels located on the highway linking Basel to Lugano and to accommodate about 20,000 people. The bunker is a seven-story building stretching downwards and in the of the FOCP would have required about 700 employees to run its beds, command station, hospital, kitchen, laundry and prison. In short, a real vault built by Voltec. It's just too bad that right now it's not as massive as planned. In 1987, a year after the Chernobyl accident, the authorities conducted a general test to evaluate the operation of the tunnel and realized the non-feasibility of the initial plan. 
In fact, it would never have been possible to cram such a large number of human beings into such a small place. In addition, getting bats through inside the narrow corridors would have been a difficult task, on par with handling telecommunications in the absence of radio contact. Last but not least, some of the doors that were supposed to seal the tunnels seem to encounter problems in closing. In 2006, the housing capacity of the Sonnenberg bunker was downsized and it's estimated that it can currently accommodate 2,000 people in case of need. There is another problem, however. According to guide Zora Schelbert, this bunker can certainly come in handy in case of natural disasters such as landslides or earthquakes, but not in case of a nuclear explosion. After all, the shelter is meant to serve as a base of support for only a few weeks, a time frame too short for the radiation outside to thin out. At present, the main function performed by the tunnel is as a tourist attraction, and in recent decades, Hundreds of unused bunkers, some dating back to the 1940s, have been converted into museums, architectural works, warehouses, mushroom farms, hotels and data centers, and even migrant shelters. An inauspicious end, you might say, but certainly dictated by the changing geopolitical environment. Although between 1982 and 1983 the Swiss government had invested $28 per capita in the defense sector, 10 more than the entire Soviet Union, the threats of the Cold War, and with it the fear of atomic attack, soon vanished. From 1989, the rate of shelter construction declined, but not the debate over the nation's total defense. During the 1980s, the Swiss parliament began to show its first doubts about fortifying the country, and the pacifist ideology, critical of the militaristic policies pursued by the federal government in previous decades, became prevalent among the intellectuals of the time. Swiss journalist Jean-Gabriel Zufferay summed them up in 1989 with the term hedgehog syndrome. Then the 1990s passed, and the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, generated a tremendous insecurity throughout the West. When, in 2005, Congressman Pierre Köhler proposed to abolish the requirement to build bunkers adjacent to private homes to avoid unnecessarily increasing the cost of real estate, the Federal Council decided that the shelters were still useful in defending the population from terrorist attacks. The issue was reignited in March 2011, following the Fukushima nuclear disaster. However, during this time, Swiss authorities have gradually relaxed the penalties for violating the federal law on civil protection. According to a new regulation that came into effect in 2012 and was confirmed in 2022, only buildings with 38 or more rooms will have to have a fallout shelter. If it's impossible for technical reasons to build one, an annual replacement fee of 800 Swiss francs, about $895 at today's exchange rate, will have to be paid to the state. The same fee is paid by all other property owners who don't want to make a home shelter, to guarantee them a place in a public bunker. The latter, however, must be located in the proximity of homes, that is a distance that can be walked in half an hour. According to current regulations, a bunker must be built according to the technical instructions issued by the Federal Department of Defense in 2017, which indicate materials, measures and maintenance activities to be followed for every facility built within the structures, from security doors to kitchens, from ventilation and communication systems to toilets and light bulbs. For the past year, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the feared use of tactical nuclear weapons has again alarmed Bern and the cantons. According to Stephen Herzog, a nuclear weapons expert working at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland is currently the country best prepared for a possible atomic conflict, not only because of the 370,000 bunkers scattered throughout its territory, but also because of the excellent level of nuclear and radiological protection provided by them. The whole of Switzerland, then, is covered by more than 7,000 sirens, which are also activated in case of more localized disasters, such as fires or floods. Finally, the alert the Swiss app, available since 2019, informs the population about current alerts and was also functional during the COVID-19 pandemic. In short, it would be fair to say that somehow the strategy of Redoubt envisioned in the late 1800s has survived to the present day. Of course, it has changed guises, it has become the armor of a small country squeezed between the Alps, but diplomatically and economically at the pinnacle of the international order. Such preparation for any kind of catastrophe is admirable as well as unmatched at present for any other state on the face of the earth. 
Sweden and Finland, second and third in class in the Bunker League, have facilities that can save only 70 and 62% of their residents respectively. Some cantons, such as Grisons and Glarus, would be able to shelter 140% of their population. This is the result of the federal government's investment of about $12 billion, diluted over 60 years. All this, of course, doesn't mean that the world's most anti-atomic nation is safe from any apocalyptic scenario. Again, according to Steven Herzog, in the event of a nuclear escalation of the Ukrainian conflict, there are so many variables at play, including weather conditions, explosive yield of weapons and altitude of detonations, that it's impossible to determine with certainty whether the distance to the war zone and the network of shelters can protect the Swiss people 100%. But then, is it really possible to survive a nuclear Armageddon? And once the world we are used to living in is devastated, what will be left of us? One thing is certain, those who come out to see the stars again had better have power armor with them. You can't know what threats might be lurking outside the vault. Well, and we are done for today. I thank you all for your attention and we'll see you in the next video. Ciao!